Hey, my name is Fernie, and I'm the pastor at Mid City Church here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I want to welcome you to season two of the Mid City Church Sermon Cast. We are so excited to get this season going. And my hope is that by the end of this season, you will be inspired to help bring about the diverse kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. What do you say? Are you ready? Let's go. the questions I have ever asked in my life, there is one question that has gotten me into quite a bit of trouble. Can you guess what the question is? It's actually a really short question. It's just three letters. Why? Now, I'll never forget, growing up, one of my responsibilities was uh, to go downstairs and feed the dogs and give them fresh water. Now, giving them food was easy because when I came downstairs, I had to walk right past the garage. So I'd grab a scoop of food, uh, pour it in their bowl, and they didn't hold on to it because when I left uh, to go to school, I had to walk through the garage and drop off the, the scoop. That part was easy. The part that was complicated, at least what I told myself was complicated, was giving the dogs water. It was just, it was just messy, and I'm a little dramatic sometimes. Here's a process. I had to get the bowl, dump out the water, go inside, wash it, rinse it out, put new water in, take it outside without spilling any, give it to the dogs, and then come inside. And, and I was just so uh, in a rush all the time that almost every single time I would spill water and get in trouble. So I just hated giving the dogs water. So there was this one time when um, I didn't just uh, forget, I actually ignored my responsibility. Here's what happened. I gave the dog some food, and then I looked at the water bowl, and there was, there was water in the bowl. It was from yesterday, but there was water in the bowl. The bowl was pretty full. It wasn't the cleanest water, but it was clean enough in my mind. So I just left it like that, went back inside, ate breakfast, got my stuff ready. And then for those of you who are parents, uh, you know when your kids are lying to you, don't you? So my dad uh, had this sixth, still has this sixth sense. So he looked at me and he said, Fernie, we need to hurry up and uh, you need to give the, the dogs water before we leave and we're running late. So you better hurry up. So uh, my natural response without thinking about it was, but dad, they already have water. And again, parents know when their kids are lying, right? My dad looked at me and he said, Fernie, that's yesterday's water. You better give them clean water right now or I'm going to leave you behind. Now, most kids would have just done what their dad asked them to do, right? Not me. I looked at my dad straight in the eyes and said, but why? Now, I'm sure you can imagine how the rest of that conversation went. I was forced to give uh, fresh water to the dogs. I even put some ice cubes in the water that day so it would stay cool for the rest of the day. And I got in the car and I was in trouble with my dad for asking why. And I don't think it was about asking why. It was just the fact that I questioned him, right? Which I totally get that. And that's another sermon for another day. But I got in trouble that day for asking why. I wish I could tell you that as I've gotten older, I've stopped asking this question, but it really is one of my favorite questions. When my wife asks me to go get uh, groceries on my way home from work, my first question is, why? Don't we have stuff at home? Or when someone calls me unexpectedly, my first response is, why are they calling? Like, what do they need, right? Uh, or, or maybe even when someone uh, wants to meet with me for coffee, the first thing I wonder is, why are, they, why are they asking me to meet with them, right? Is there something wrong? Like, why are they calling me? And, and uh, when I'm at the doctor's office and the doctor gives me new medicine, why do I have to take this new medicine, right? Why are you giving me this new prescription? I love to ask why. I, I probably even long to know why. And most importantly, I really won't get behind something unless I know why I'm being asked to do it. See, for me, knowing why is very important. Knowing why we do something inspires me and motivates me to give something my very best. So let's go back to me feeding the dogs and giving them fresh water. If my dad tells me, which is what he did, like, give the dogs water because I said so. That doesn't really motivate me. That why doesn't really motivate me, right? But if my dad had said, give the dogs water because otherwise they're going to uh, they're gonna uh, be extremely thirsty all day and they need water to survive. And without the water, they might have a heat stroke and be dead by the time we get home. 
That's a very clear why to me, right? It's a little dramatic, but it's a very clear why. Give the dogs water or they might die. That inspires me to give the dogs water. In fact, I will even give them ice water and you know, maybe put some flavoring in the water. I don't know. But the why really inspires me. See, knowing and understanding why we do something, for me at least, is inspirational. It motivates and that even makes me, and I think many of us, more willing to cooperate. How about you? Any of you like that? So in 2009, author Simon Sinek gave a TED Talk in Newcastle, Washington, titled Start With Why. And since its release, it's had over 56 million views online and has led to the writing of multiple books. The first one and most famous of them being uh, titled Start With Why. Now, in this book, Sinek gives light to the idea that most people know what they do and how they do it. So just think about this for a second. When you start a new job, you're given a job description. That job description tells you what you're going to do, right? Then if it's a good organization, they're probably going to train you and that person teaches you how to do it, right? So most people know what they do and how to do it. They know what their job is and how to get their job done. Now, um, what Sinek argues is that successful people and successful organizations don't just know what and how, but they know why. They know why they're doing the thing they're doing. They know why, uh, the, the, knowing their why runs the organization and inspires the organization and motivates the organization, right? Does this make sense? Okay. Here's the thing that Sinek warns about, though. He argues that some organizations and even some people like you and I, or why becomes to make money. But he argues that, that uh, making money is not a, a good why because it'll lead us to make bad decisions. It'll lead us to make uh, uh, things that don't fall in line, uh, choices that don't fall in line with our values and our mission and our vision. And so he says like every organization has to have a why that really speaks to its core of who it is and what it's here to do. And money will only get us so far, right? So I've thrown a lot, but just go with me for a second. Let me explain. Have you ever heard of Southwest Airlines? Now, many of us have probably flown Southwest and we've maybe seen uh, commercials or advertisement for Southwest. I think we all know about Southwest Airlines. So one of the things that is core to Southwest is uh, three things. Cheap, it's cheap, it's fun, and it's simple, right? Uh, if you, I don't know about you, but when Susie and I are looking at flights, we always look at Southwest on top of other airlines because Southwest tends to be cheaper. It's not always the cheapest, but tends to be cheaper, right? It's also fun in the sense that uh, if you've ever been on a Southwest flight, you know that the flight attendants tend to uh, do the, give their instructions a little bit different. And I don't know about you, but when I'm on a Southwest flight, I tend to pay more attention because they usually say some funny things or they have some quirks on the flight. And then it's simple, right? Right? You get online and you buy a ticket. You don't have to worry about buying a seat. You don't have to worry about buying a first class or main cat. It's just buy a ticket, right? Cheap, fun, and simple. Now, this uniqueness to Southwest has, be, has made it one of the most profitable airlines in the country. In fact, in 2019, Southwest was the fourth most profitable airline that year, grossing in about $2.3 billion in income. Here's the thing about Southwest, though. This idea of cheap, fun, and simple was not original to them. In 1949, an airline called, uh, called Pacific Southwest Airlines launched in San Diego, California. Now, they, they had this model of cheap, fun, and simple. And much like Southwest when it started, this was a regional airline. So it flew out of San Diego to a lot of um, cities in California and that really that Southwest region. Now, they believed uh, in this, this cheap uh, airline, so they were the first airline to introduce uh, these, these uh, lower cost uh, flights. They believed in fun, so they had this um, same thing that Southwest does of having flight attendants have fun with what they're doing and more a little bit more entertaining. And uh, in fact, they believed in fun so much that their planes, they, they painted smiles on the front of all of their planes. So if you ever looked at, at a plane head on, you would see it smiling back at you. And I don't know about you, but when somebody smiles at you, you can't help but smile back, right? So just imagine sitting in the airport and you see this, a plane smiling at you. It'll probably make you smile. And they also believed in simple. They were one of the first airlines to introduce this like simple one ticket gets you anywhere in the plane kind of thing. So um, 
Southwest really uh, was intrigued by this uh, model that Pacific Southwest had created. And so about 19 years later, Southwest Airlines was created, but in out of San Antonio. And it was supposed to be for that region, San Antonio, Dallas, Austin, that, that whole uh, East Texas area. Now, here's what's fascinating about this. Southwest Airlines copied almost everything about Pacific Southwest Airlines. Uh, they're, they're cheap, they're, they're fun, they're simple model. They copied almost all of it. They even copied the name, right? Pacific Southwest, Southwest Airlines. Like they, they, they copied so much of it. And yet, 18 years, uh, uh, 30 years, excuse me, 30 years after it launched, Pacific Southwest Airlines stopped reporting major profits that they once reported and ended up merging with U.S. Airways. So, I mean, just think about this, right? Southwest copies this model from another company, and then they outlive this other company, right? That, that's pretty fascinating to me. Well, here's what's even more fascinating to me. Southwest, like I said, has reported major uh, um, profit year after year after year. And so uh, other airlines began to copy them. So in 2003, Delta launched their low-cost alternative named Song Airlines. And in 2004, United launched TED Airlines. Now, both of these were meant to copy this cheap, fun, and simple model that Southwest had, had copied out of Pacific Southwest. And, and they were hoping to break into this market that Southwest had had so much success in. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that's really interesting about all this. In 2006, Song uh, ceased operations. And then in 2009, Ted did the same. So here's four companies that have all followed the same model. Their, their what and their how was all the same. And only one of them survived. What is it about Southwest that made it survive? Sinek would argue, and he actually does, he argues that Southwest was the only one of these four airlines that understood its why. They were the only organization who knew why they were working and why they were doing everything they were doing. So let's talk about their why really quick. If you, like I said, if you've ever flown Southwest or you've ever flown any airlines and, uh, or been in any airport, you've heard the phrase, want to get away? Right? You, we've all heard this phrase, want to get away. This is at its core uh, what Southwest Airlines' why is. They want to help people get away. They want to help people travel. They, they uh, just want to help the common person like you and I move about this country uh, as often and as easily as possible. And so just think about how clever this why is, right? So just imagine yourself for a second. That uh, you're at work and you're having a rough day at work. You're just, everybody's annoying you. Everything's annoying you. Your boss keeps putting more and more work on your desk. And all of a sudden you get a little bit of a break. You, you get on social media and the first thing you see is an ad for Southwest Airlines. And it says, want to get away? Uh, flights as cheap as $59.99. What's your answer? Yes, I want to get away. I don't want to be here right now, right? Uh, or just think about your kids are driving you absolutely crazy, or your spouse is driving you absolutely crazy, and you, you see an ad on TV that says, want to get away? Yes, get me out of here, right? And, and this is true about uh, uh, so many different scenarios, right? We, we, maybe we're just planning a next vacation, maybe whatever it is, we hear this phrase, want to get away, and the answer usually is yes, I just want to get out of here, I want to go travel and explore, right? So Southwest has uh, held uh, really tight to this uh, why that they've carried from the very beginning, right? To help this, the common person travel around the country, to help every single one of us get away. And every decision they have ever made falls back be, uh, to that why. It, it comes from that why. At its core of every decision is this why to help people get away. So j just think about this for a second. You want to know why their flights are so cheap? Because the average person can afford them and they can get away. Do you want to know why their website is so easy to use? So that the average person can get online and book a flight and get away. Do you ever wonder why it's so easy to change your flights and, and to cancel flights on Southwest? Because the average person deals with life and life throws stuff at us every once in a while. And we have to cancel our flights. That's what happens sometimes. And they want to make it easy for the average person who deals with life to be able to just change their flight or cancel their flight. And if all of this is too stressful for you, then just pay $30 and you can get on before everybody else and get whatever seat you want, right? I mean, they make it every decision that they've made is to help people get away. 
That's what it means to know your why and to live into your why. You know why you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing it, right? But you know why you're doing all of this. Now, here's what I love about this concept of why. It's not just some guy named Simon Sinek who came up with this model. If we pay close attention in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus begins his ministry by proclaiming his own why to everybody around him. Listen to what it says in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet of Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now, I love this uh, scripture and this, this chapter in particular, because there's five things that Jesus proclaims as his why. But before we go into that, I want you to notice one thing. Jesus begins this, this, this uh, season of his life um, by saying that he has anointed me. He uses these words, he has anointed me. See, this is um, uh, the, the why that Jesus is about to share. Jesus is making it very clear that this why came from God, that he has this God, uh, God-given why that he's going to live into for the rest of his life. So what is this why? What does this why look like? So there are five things Jesus says. The first thing he says is, is my God-given why is to bring good news to the poor. So in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story about a poor man named Lazarus, who after dying, he is carried by the angels to heaven. Now, this is a really important story because at the time, if you were poor, it meant you didn't have God's favor and would probably not go to heaven. There was this mindset that only rich people were favored by God and therefore only rich people went to heaven. But in this story, as as Jesus is talking in Luke 16, We're told that this poor man goes to heaven, right? This is good news to all the poor. The second thing that Jesus says is his why, this his God-given why, is to proclaim release to the captives. Now in Luke 23, Jesus literally, there's this literal prisoner named Barabbas, and Jesus releases him from captivity, from prison, in exchange for his own life, right? Uh, The third thing Jesus says that his God-given why is to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus restores the sight of a blind beggar in Jericho. The fourth uh, thing that Jesus says is part of his uh, God-given why is to let the oppressed go free. Now, a little bit earlier in chapter 18, Jesus says this powerful quote. He says, will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? In other words, all those people who have been oppressed and long for justice, God has heard their cry and justice will be theirs, right? The oppressed will go free. And the fifth thing Jesus says that uh, is part of his God-given why is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Luke 17, Jesus proclaims that the kingdom of God, the thing that they've all been waiting for, is among them. I love how the message translation say it, says it. It says, it's God's time to shine, right? Jesus says, this is my why in my ministry and in my life, right? This is my God-given why. This is the thing that I have come to do. And if you pay close attention, you realize that Jesus' whole life, everything he does falls into one of these five categories, especially in the Gospel of Luke. Everything Jesus does in his life falls back to this why that that he uh, proclaimed at the very beginning. Friends, it's so important for us to follow our own why. So what is our why and how do we begin to live into it? Now, if you don't remember anything else from this sermon cast, I want you to remember this. Our why, the thing that inspires everything we do around here, the thing that inspires uh, me each and every morning to get up and get to work, is uh, uh, it's to go out into this world and inspire people to, to give a glimpse of heaven to everyone. My, my, my hope every single day is that we can inspire you and everyone around you to go out into this world and help bring about the diverse kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. And this is like, this is our why. This motivates how we do small groups, how we do worship, how we do service in the community to help bring about the kingdom of God is our why. And it inspires everything we do. And believe it or not, I know that might sound complicated to you, but it's actually a lot easier than you might think. 
about six years ago, my friend Josh was walking through downtown Baton Rouge and he noticed a large number of homeless people. Now, you have to understand that it would have been very easy for Josh to notice this homeless population and just walk on by. Josh was not in the most in the best financial situation ever. He had just gotten out of rehab, a rehab, he didn't have a stable job, and honestly, money was really tight for him. But seeing this homeless population really bothered him. So he decided to make a difference. So here's what he did. Despite, and I'll be honest about this, despite me trying to convince him to not do this because of his financial financial situation, Every week, Josh would take his, his check for playing in the band, and he would use $20 from that check to buy burgers at McDonald's. He would buy the, the dollar menu back when they really were a dollar, and he would uh, buy about 18 burgers and hand them out to people in downtown Baton Rouge. Then, then uh, as word started getting out about him doing this, people would wait for him after worship and give him some extra money so he could go buy more burgers and give out to more people. And so uh, as that uh, movement grew, then McDonald's started giving him free fries every, every couple weeks. And so it eventually got to the point where he was walking downtown, giving people a couple burgers and some fries. And it was, it's not a balanced meal, but it was a full meal, right? It was, it was plenty for people to be at least full for the rest of the day. That movement grew so much that eventually it got to the point where on Saturdays people would gather to bring food, warm meals with salad and, and food and a side and, uh, and, and they would feed about 100 to 200 people every Saturday. And in fact, it grew so much that Josh stepped back from that and the, there's other people who are now running that and doing that. See, Josh started to give people a glimpse of heaven by giving one burger. And that one burger turned into two. Those two burgers turned into burgers and fries. Those, the, then that turned into to bigger meals. Like Josh began to give people a glimpse of heaven with something small. And slowly that began to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And all along the way, Josh's why was clear. To give people heaven by offering something to eat, right? And every decision from that point forward came from that why. See, here's my challenge for you. How will you help to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven? How will you help to give people a glimpse of heaven every single day? And don't be afraid to start small. All we need to do is to give people a glimpse. And the hope is that that glimpse will inspire others to continue to do the same. And friends, I believe that if we can make every decision revolve around that why of helping to bring about the kingdom of God, I believe we can make a major impact in our communities and in our world. And so that's my challenge to you this week. What is your why? How can you help to bring about the kingdom of God? And, and my hope is that as you're able to articulate that why, that you will go out into the world and do it, not only to bring about uh, heaven for others, but so that we can inspire others to be a part of this journey as well. May it be so. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Mid-City Church Sermon Cast. If you'd like to dive deeper, visit midcity.church slash sermoncast to find a home sheet that goes along with this message. On the home sheet, you'll find scriptures, questions to wrestle with, and a challenge that goes along with this sermon cast. I want to invite you to support our ministry here at Mid-City Church by giving today. To give, text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to the phone number 225-307-0662. Thanks and see you next week.